Hi, and welcome to our AMA with Professor Joel Pearson. I'm Tommy Beyer, founder of Aphantasia Network. Over the last few weeks, we've been gathering your questions and thoughts about Aphantasia and our imagination, and we can't wait to see what questions you throw our way over the next hour. We're going to get to as many questions as we can, but even now it's become evidently clear that we're going to have to do a part two. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's start. Professor Joel Pearson is the founder and director of the Future Minds Lab at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Future Minds Lab strives for radical discovery and the application of those discoveries to reduce suffering and optimize performance. Joel studies the mechanisms and application of mental imagery, amongst other things, using behavioral, human brain imaging, and brain stimulation techniques. He is now considered the world expert in mental imagery and aphantasia. Please welcome Professor Joel Pearson. Hey, Tom. It's great hey to there. be here. That uh, cool intro. Very nice. Cool. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, Hopefully, we can get to some good questions and I can provide some, some answers, which is going to be the harder part, and try and satisfy all those, uh, all those people out there. Yeah, great. Uh, well, let's start easy. How did you get involved in mental imagery research? Well, yeah, the, the, the origin stories it would be, I guess, with with this one was I was I was at uh, Vanderbilt University, in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was playing around with an experiment. It wasn't actually a mental imagery experiment uh, at the time, and I programmed it up. And I thought, I wonder what happens if I imagine one of these patterns. So I was programming an experiment with red and green patterns. Um, and we'll get, probably get to this thing called binocular rivalry a little bit later on. So I was playing around with binocular rivalry and I thought, huh, just for, just for the hell of it, I'll imagine one of those patterns. So I imagined the green pattern, then I hit a button and the binocular rivalry display came on. And I was like, huh, I saw the thing I imagined. I thought, that's, that's weird, it's probably a coincidence. Um, and I tried it again, same thing again. I thought, oh, I'll imagine the other color, I imagine the red. And I flashed on this binocular rivalry illusion again, and I saw the red. And I was like, oh, this, this is strange. What I'm imagining, what I'm visualizing in my mind's eye is changing how I see this visual illusion, this binocular rivalry illusion. So I got really interested in that, started playing around with it. Uh, and that's how that first experiment got going. And that's really how I got pulled into the world of imagery research. I'd like to say it was, you know, for grand, theoretical reasons and philosophy and this and that, but it was really just programming hacking. And so almost an accidental discovery there that the content of visual imagery can change perception, change the way we see the world. Um, and then that discovery sort of went on. We, we did a whole big paper on that. And since then, there's been many more, more papers utilizing that illusion to measure mental imagery, to measure visual imagery. So it was almost like an accidental discovery, which is, I think, really nice, uh, a nice part of science. Awesome, yeah, uh, that's really great. And, and uh, we're so glad to have you here to continue that. Uh, let's get to some of the questions. Uh, maybe we yeah. can start kind of at a high level. What's happening in an aphantasic brain? Uh, why can't we imagine pictures? That is the question, right? And so, but what we know so far, and we know on most of the research, so we've been studying mental imagery, visual imagery in general now for you know, 12, 13, 15 years. And we've got a couple of good clues so far. We know that one, the size of visual cortex, right? So that's the little part of your brain back here, the pointy part of your, behind the pointy part of your skull is your visual cortex. And when people uh, have a smaller visual cortex, we tend to see that their imagery is stronger so that was the first piece of the puzzle. Then in uh, subsequent work, we looked at something called cortical excitability. And there are a number of ways you can think about that, but an easy way to think about it is just how noisy those neurons are uh, in your brain all the time. So when the neurons back here are actually quieter, people also seem to have stronger imagery. And not only do we see that correlation there, we can use a type of brain stimulation to up or down regulate that neural noise, if you like, and accordingly up or down regulate visual imagery strength. So we did that in a group of people who already have imagery, right? So they already had some imagery, and we could turn it up with brain stimulation or actually turn it down with a different type of brain stimulation. So we've shown that, we've published that in, in a paper now. 
And so the logic would go that those similar mechanisms would be somewhat different in people with aphantasia. We haven't done or we haven't finished those experiments yet, but the logic would hold. And so the next question people often ask then is, well, what happens if you take someone without any imagery, someone with aphantasia, and apply those brain stimulation techniques? So we haven't done that yet, I haven't got the answer, but I don't think that'll be enough to give someone the capacity to visualize. I think you'll need to combine that kind of brain stimulation with some training. I just will elaborate quickly on that. Um, if you think about a language, there are language parts of the brain. You can stimulate the language parts of the brain and you can change how people can speak the language, but you can't stimulate that part of the brain and give someone instantly the ability to speak a new language. I can't stimulate my language parts of my brain and just be able to speak German or French or Chinese. And so I think you have to practice, in this, in this case, practice visualization in combination with some type of brain stimulation. That's probably where I think the, the, the key to utilizing these discoveries to give people the option if they wanted to, to have visualization capacity. Great, thanks for that. Uh, let's see what the next, the next question is here. What percentage of aphantasics are affected in all of the senses? Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting question. What we know so far in the data we have is about, what is it, about 20 or 30%, I think it's about 25% of people have what we call multi-sensory aphantasia, if you like. So that is being blind in the mind across all the different senses. There's no inner monologue, they can't um, play or listen to music in their mind's ear, if you like. They can't um, imagine the flavor of coffee or, of, or the smell of coffee. So they're com sort of completely blind across those different senses. Um, and then for the other, for the majority, you have a lot of people with pure visual aphantasia. Again, in the data we have, we've recruited based on that definition. And so it's hard to know what that natural percentage would be um, out there in the world. But you also find people with um, isolated, um, just auditory aphantasia, if you like, or olfaction aphantasia or taste aphantasia. Yeah. But we do see that there, there is this uh, group of people that are completely blind in the mind, if you like, across all their senses. Hmm. I would fall in that 25% myself. Uh, no, yeah. no imagery in any of the senses, which I see some, some comments here coming in. Um, do you think it's due to nature and present at birth? That's from- Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so people, have, We've been using the phrase congenital, so like born with aphantasia. There is also acquired aphantasia. There's a number of cases now um, where people through different means have acquired aphantasia later in life. So there have been um, some through some accidents, through surgery. There are some cases from, from people taking medication that seem to have induced uh, aphantasia. But then there are these other group of cases, congenital, where people have had aphantasia for as long as they can remember, or they've always just thought like that, their brain has always behaved like that. So we haven't um, done the study where we would test, you know, babies or young children and follow them through yet. But as far as we know, then there is uh, a subset of people that would either be born with that um, or acquire it very early in life. And so if that's the case, it does suggest that there could be some um, hereditary factor, there might be some genetics involved there. Uh, interestingly, before I mentioned visual cortex size, we know that um, the size of your visual cortex uh, across the population changes a lot. There are people with sort of visual cortex three or four times larger than other people. Uh, and I think there's some genes that code for that. So there are some genetic contributions to the size of your visual cortex. That tends to correlate with visual imagery strength. And so it makes sense that there is some genes maybe that may be affecting aphantasia but we haven't got the, the, all the data yet to really be sure. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, for myself, uh, I, I think it's always been from birth. Thanks for that question, Mary. Yeah. How does aphantasia affect our memory? Yeah, so memory is a, is a big thing, right? There are many different types of memory. So we can think of short-term, working memory, it's called, so trying to remember a phone number, trying to remember what I just did a second ago. And we've shown uh, that 
for visual working memory, so when you have to remember visual things, visual patterns, people who have imagery tend to use imagery um, as a mnemonic, as a memory aid to remember things. Um, so there's that, and then there's long, sort of longer term memory. There's a whole uh, area of research around what you can call memory palace, memory palaces where people, again, use visualization capacity. So their visual imagery to put objects around in a space and they imagine themselves walking through that space. The deck of cards, right? You can put cards around, let's say your childhood home. And as you walk through, imagining walking through that home, you remember where those objects are, you see them and you can report you know, a full deck of cards. So there's those kind of memory uh, uh, things. There's what's called episodic memory. So the memories throughout my life. Uh, and there's, again, many other different types of memory. So what we know, as I said, we know that imagery plays can play a role in visual working memory, short-term memory. What we've just sort of documented is that if you don't have imagery, if you're aphantasic, you can still perform quite well and very well in these short-term working memory tasks. But the way you hold things in memory is quite different. And therefore, your memory is liable to disruption in different kinds of ways. So if I'm using visual imagery to hold something in memory and someone flashes bright lights in my eyes, um, that will disrupt my imagery and I'll forget what I'm trying to remember. If I don't have imagery, I'm going to use a different uh, strategy and different mechanism, different brain mechanism to remember that. And so if I flash lights in my eyes and I'm using a high level non-visual strategy, if you like, then I probably will hang on to those memories. So we're also seeing some interesting data coming in now with episodic memory, so how I experience the memories over my lifetime. Um, and if you can't visualize those memories, the memories are still there, as I'm sure you guys all know, but there are some differences across the board. Um, so we've done some work on that. It's not been published yet, but it's not, there are some subtle differences across the board. Obviously, the memories are less vivid in terms of sensory details, um, and there also seems to be some effects in terms of the number of details um, that you can recall uh, without imagery. So they're the, they're the two sort of main areas. Again, there's all kinds of other kinesthetic memory, memory for sports, learning a new sport, all those kinds of things. And there is some evidence that imagery can be used for training. You know, if you've ever watched the, the Olympics and what's it called, these, the the, 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 the thing where you're in the little bobsled thing going down the ice, you see people practicing and imagining uh, each turn, right? They have to sort of have it really tightly memorized and they'll visualize it. Um, and so visualization is a, a strategy across many sports. And so it would logically then hold that if you don't have the capacity to visualize, um, then those sporting experiences and training might also be different, but it's still early days. We don't really know that for sure yet. Hmm. Here's a question uh, from YouTube. Question for <laughs> Joel. Is there a formal diagnosis for aphantasia? Is it viable for one to be formed in the future? And would it be more of a neurological one or a self-report? Yeah, so that's a great question. That's something that, yeah, lots of medical doctors and neurologists are asking and individuals, of course. So, yeah, me and Tom have discussed this a lot. Um, so at the present, um, so let me back out a bit. So the difficulty with, with visualisation and mental imagery has been that up until recently um, you had to self-report. You had to use a questionnaire, right? So I had to, And when you do a questionnaire, you've got to imagine a sunset, and then report your experience about that. And we know from tons and tons of uh, psychology research that while questionnaires are great, um, different scenarios can really influence the data. If you're trying to, if someone's giving you the questionnaire, you're trying to impress them, you'll answer it quite differently to if you're sitting there by yourself. And so when we use questionnaires, depending on who the participants are, if they're undergraduates, if they're people in general public, what time of day, it can influence the data. So that was the gold standard. Now we've developed this binocular rivalry method where we can measure the sensory strength of visual imagery um, and we can make that quite objective. I'm happy to go into the nerdy details of how we can do that even without self-report now. Um, we have some other uh, papers in the pipeline where we have even more objective physiological measurements um, using skin conductance, using pupil response and some other methods. And so 
the way I think it's trending is that rather than using one single method, it will be sort of two of those. You'd have like a, uh, an imagery index or an aphantasia index where you might combine, let's say, some a questionnaire with the binocular ivory method or the questionnaire with some kind of pupil response measurement. So you want to combine a subjective measurement with a, an objective measurement and have that as the uh, aphantasia or mental imagery index, let's call it for now. Um, and that's probably as close as we can get to some kind of diagnostic criteria. Um, again, I'm talking very generally here. We, we know, as I said before, that there are very different types of aphantasia as there are many different types of imagery across the senses, um, spatial and otherwise. And so I think it's gonna be a lot more complex than that. So we, what I'm talking about is just measuring and assessing visual imagery, the capacity to visualize objects or people's faces, that kind of thing which is very different from whether I can visualize it and spatially superimpose it uh, in this room now or have it behind me, right? Those spatial capacities are very different. Um, so I think as time goes on, we'll build out that index with different measurement techniques. Ben, great question. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, here's, a, here's another one from Peter. How does aphantasia impact emotional regulation? Ah, uh, that's... That's, that's a great question. So, yeah, the, the historical research on mental imagery and emotion is really, really interesting. And so we know from a lot of research that anxiety um, is closely linked to mental imagery. And, in fact, if you look at the definition of PTSD, you'll see it more or less uh, describes, if you like, uncontrollable traumatic images that flash into your mind, right? And so there is some leeway there to have, I guess, PTSD without images, but on the whole, it's normally defined that way. And so we know that imagery plays a role in PTSD. We know that people with stronger imagery are more likely to go on to get PTSD after a traumatic experience. Um, and we see imagery related to other things. So we've looked at uh, um, Parkinson's disease and hallucinations there, and the strength of imagery goes on to predict the probability for like having hallucinations there. We see an elevation in imagery strength in schizophrenia, so so this sort of change in imagery strength, in fact, an increase in imagery strength, um, tends to be associated with, uh, I guess, sort of negative symptoms in, in a number of diseases. So the, again, we're doing this research now, so I can't talk too much about it, but it would then hold that there should be differences across the board if you don't have any um, visualization capacity. Right, so, so the logic would suggest if you may be less likely to go on to get PTSD after experiencing a trauma. Um, so we have a paper probably coming out about around the end of next week, I think, where we sort of try to look at the link between thoughts and emotion. Uh, we have a preprint of this, which has already been up on a server for a while. Um, so in this study, we had people um, sit in a dark room, we put a skin conductance measurement thing on their fingers uh, as a proxy to, to tap into the emotional activity in their brain. And they're reading out um, emotional scenarios on the screen. So they're sort of reading things like, you know, uh, you're swimming in the ocean, you see a shadow come underneath you, something bumps your leg, you look back to the beach and people are screaming at you, and sort of quite emotive, scary things. And we can measure that skin conductance and people with imagery, as they're reading these scenarios, their skin conductance level goes up and up. And that's a nice proxy of their sort of their fear response as it's building. Our group participants without imagery um, didn't really have that effect. It was, it was much more flat. Again, I'm talking about, um, on average, they're looking at these two groups, right? So there's variance for any single individual. Um, so those data really suggest that imagery plays this really interesting role to support, if you like, our thoughts and emotions. And having this sort of sensory simulation in between there links those two and really lets us, or you could almost say it tricks the brain almost into thinking that some of the content of our thoughts could be real because our sensory parts of our brain are active. Yeah. All right, uh, lots of questions coming in here. Melanie says, do you think aphantasia can have a positive impact on dealing with trauma due to the inability to revisit? Yeah, I think I think it's early days yet with the research, but I think it is gonna be kind of like that. Like I said just before, that if you 
if you're aphantasic, you have aphantasia, you're less likely to go on to develop anxiety disorders after a trauma. You'll be less likely to have PTSD. Um, we are looking at some studies now looking at sort of mind wandering and thought control. So there's some interesting things you can do where you say, hey, you know, don't think about the, the white elephant or the pink elephant, right? This, how much can I control my own thoughts? And I think imagery also plays a role in that process as well. Um, so it would stand that if I don't have imagery, I should be able to control what I'm thinking about a little bit better as well. Yeah. Great. Okay, here's a question from Victoria. Does having aphantasia influence our personality or are there many common traits just, or are the many common traits just coincidences? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the straight up thing is we don't know yet. Um, We've said there are some studies that show some correlations, I think, between some parts and personality traits uh, and, and imagery. Uh, again, these, these studies were done not with aphantasia and using questionnaires. So we do see studies linking you know, openness to experience and creativity and things like that with high scores on, on imagery questionnaires like the VBIQ. We haven't done those studies with the more objective techniques yet. We haven't done those studies with individuals with aphantasia or hyperphantasia either. So it's it's early days yet. So I don't have a definitive answer, sorry. Hmm. No problem, thanks for the question. Uh, let's see what's next here. How does it affect our learning? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I feel a lot of school teachers reaching out with that question, right? So, you know, I don't wanna jump in because learning theory in schools is quite a controversial topic. And there's been lots of ideas bouncing around that, you know, I'm a visual learner, I'm an auditory learner, I'm this kind of learner. Um, and as far as I understand, a lot of those theories haven't held up that well. Um, I do know that there's data that the more or our senses we can involve in, involve in learning the process and bring in new information, um, probably the better it is retained. If sensory simulation is useful for rehearsing information, like I mentioned, you know, learning a new motor, motor sports in the Olympics or something before, um, then I think having or not having imagery should make a difference when I'm rehearsing things, right? So I can simulate, I can imagine myself um, doing, learning something, doing mathematics or doing any kind of process. I should be able to learn from that simulation experience. If I can't do that, learning should be different. We need to be careful here because as we've seen with um, the short-term working memory experiments we've done here in the lab, um, even though you can, people don't have imagery, they still perform really well with, in memory, um, with the short-term memory experiments. So even though they're not using imagery, they, there are other ways of doing it, there are other strategies to do um, short-term working memory tasks. And likewise, I think there's gonna be other strategies to do learning. And so that's kind of the theme of a lot of what we're seeing uh, in aphantasia research is that if you just look at performance, often you can't tell the difference. Even though someone without imagery is gonna be learning something, uh, holding something in memory very differently, probably using different brain networks uh, and a different strategy, their performance is gonna be about the same. So that suggests that people without imagery have just learned different strategies to do things and are getting by in, in the same way. And you can't even tell the difference if you're just looking at sort of top level performance. So yeah, kind of a non-answer answer, answer, but there we go. (laughs) No, that's great. Uh, Here's another one from Natalie. Have you explored any correlations between ADHD and aphantasia? Oh, good question, Natalie. We haven't done that yet, no. We haven't, yeah, we haven't, we haven't got that study on the cards, but that's an interesting question, yeah. I guess I would say anything that involves a change in sensory simulation, um, we might expect to see a difference in aphantasia. Um, I don't know a lot about ADHD, but as I said before, we do see uh, changes in imagery, strength and vividness across a number of disorders. Um, and so it wouldn't be too surprising if we saw it in ADHD as well. Um, but I'm not aware of any of that research yet. Great, thanks for the question. 
Uh, here's one from Lori. How is it that I have such mental imagery in dreams, but not awake? Yeah, great question. And that, and that, that sort of leads into a topic that I'm really passionate about is sort of looking at different types of, uh, if you like, we'll call it imagery, but sort of voluntary versus involuntary, right? If it's a spectrum um, where you can have these, what I'll call involuntary or automatic hallucinations or images, um, and we have lots of ways of inducing those illusions in the lab, but dreams is a fantastic example of that. When I'm dreaming, I'm not trying to conjure up a mental image of an apple like I am if I do it now. It's much more automatic. Um, so we have some data we've collected on dreams, and we see that some people with aphantasia dream, some people not so much. On average, if you look at that as a group, you do see across the board differences, much less sensory details, things like that. But there seems to be a lot of variance there. Um, we have one person who just reports not dreaming at all, uh, someone who reports dreaming fairly normally with aphantasia. Again, we've done this research so far only with questionnaires we've given people. Um, to do really good sort of dream research, you want to um, wait till people go to sleep, go into um, REMS or rapid eye movement, wait till they should be dreaming, wake them up and ask them to report about what they're dreaming. And that way um, you're not relying on the memory of those dreams so much. And so as far as I know, no one's done that with aphantasia uh, yet, but that'd be a fantastic experiment. But coming back to the essence of your question, I think there's gonna be a difference uh, in the mechanisms behind this voluntary and involuntary imagery. And so, again, it won't be the same for everyone with aphantasia, but I think when it's automatic and you don't have to voluntarily create that mental imagery, um, there's gonna be slightly different brain mechanisms and hence, you'll have people that cannot voluntarily visualize, but can do or see some of these involuntary types of dreaming, some of the visual illusions we uh, use in the lab. Um, yeah, so I think there's gonna be a sort of distinction there between the voluntary and involuntary. Yeah, such an interesting one for sure. Thanks for that question, mm -hmm. Laurie. All right. Let's see what's coming up next here. Okay, I think I'll pick one myself. Um, how reliable is self-report? Oh, controversial topic. I don't want to say too, too many bad things about self-report and offend all my colleagues. But, but it, like I said, it's for certain things, that's all we have, and so it's great. But it's not as reliable as um, an objective measure. So what we want to do when we're looking at brain mechanisms um, of anything is try and get an objective way to measure that. And that's one of the things we've really tried to do uh, across a number of topics here in the lab. And so if you look at the last sort of 10, 12 years of mental imagery research, once we had objective ways to measure that. So the binocular ivory method was really the first way to do that behaviorally. And then we, on top of that, we have ways to do that in a brain scanner with fMRI. And then those other methods I mentioned, uh, in addition, we can do skin conductance uh, and pupil response now. And so going from subjective to objective really gives us a much more reliable data set. So once we have those, we can start looking at the hood, we can start figuring out the brain mechanisms, the brain networks, um, like we've been doing with the cortical excitability, the size of visual cortex. Um, and that kind of research is just too hard to do with subjective self-reports. And so, yeah, I mean, questionnaires are really good. And when, if you don't have anything else, they're, they're gold, right? They're fantastic. But all kinds of things can influence um, questionnaires. Just like if you're doing an interview, right, with a job interview or any interview, um, it's really liable to different kinds of influence, right? The kind of clothes I'm wearing, a white lab coat, a suit or a T-shirt, and I'm interviewing someone, that, that can change the dynamics of the interview, can change the data. And likewise, the context um, around the questionnaire, when they're doing it, where they're doing it, what's happened in that day can also influence um, the questionnaire data. So it is much more liable to um, noise and disruption. But again, if that's all you have, then that's all you have. Great. Here's one for you. Is imagination and visualization the same thing? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people like discussing that. Yeah, it's, it's, well, I think I'm not a huge fan of getting stuck on semantics. 
Um, well, I think they're not the same thing. Visualization is a more specific term just for visualizing how something looks, thinking about the way an apple looks. Imagination gets used by different people. It's been sort of stretched out to include, some people use it to include creativity uh, and other things. I tend to, it still has the word image in it, right? So imagination. So I still think of it as meaning um, creating images. So similar, to, more similar to visualization. Other people, I said, like I said, have stretched out to include creativity. I mean, they're just words, right? And so what I care about is understanding why someone can visualize, why someone has strong mental imagery, why they have a strong imagination, and why someone else doesn't, and all the mechanisms underneath that, and then turn that information into a tool so we can optimize and help people if they want that. Um, we can always come up with new words, new definitions for these things, um, but we want, we want to discover the underlying mechanisms. We want to figure out how these things work. And I'm not too fussed which words we use as long as we're clear and we use those words in the same way. So if imagination, I've used that word before in the title of papers, if it's too confusing, then I'm happy to stop using it and pick a different word. Um, yeah. I mean, my take, as I said, would be that if you want to talk about creativity, then talk, use that word. If you want to talk about visualization capacity, then you can say visualization, mental imagery, the mind's eye, imagination, sort of incorporating all that. But it does seem to have the word image in it still. So it seems to be linked through to creating images somehow still. Great. Thanks for that one. Um, OK. Lots of questions still coming in. This is great. Uh, is a cure theoretically possible? <laughs> well, let me just ad address the, the, the premise of the question, right? We shouldn't use the word cure because aphantasia or hyperphantasia is not a disease in itself. We shouldn't call it that. And it should, so we shouldn't use the phrase cure because that suggests that there's a problem and that something needs fixing. I don't think that's the case. I think it's more a case of the tremendous neural diversity we have. And um, what's almost more surprising is the, the, the amazing ability our brains have to overcome those differences. Like I was saying before, our brains can function such different ways. Um, and if you just look at performance, even on some of the lab tasks, you can't tell that people are doing uh, memory tasks in completely different ways. So I think it's part of the spectrum of, of being human, of having diversity, having different brains and therefore different minds. So I don't think it's a disease that needs to be curing. That being said, when I've asked, uh, and it'd be great if you guys want to sort of jump in here and, and say, vote if you would, if, if we had a way to, like I said, you go through a training regime along with brain stimulation, for example, and then you have imagery. The catch is probably going to be that if we can do that, we probably won't be able to switch it off again. We won't be able to reverse it. So I'm sort of more interested in hearing from you guys. If we could do that, would you want to have imagery if it was non-reversible? And most people say if it's reversible, absolutely, I want to try it and then switch it off if I don't like it. But most probably it won't be that simple. It'll it won't be that easy. It'll be once you have it, you probably can't switch it off again. And so I'd love to hear some way to vote on the platform um, if you would like to have imagery. And, um, it's a bit of a gamble, but yeah. So I think we will have a way at some stage to give people the experience of having imagery or you have that as a sort of mental tool, like I said, through some kind of training and brain stimulation. Um, we're not there yet, but I'm, but I'm hopeful we will be in the next few years. Yeah, that uh, you summed it up perfectly there. I even described myself. You know, uh, if I, you know, if I could take a pill and visualize for a day, I would probably try it. But if you said it was all or nothing, you know, I'd, I'd probably have to deeply consider that and, and probably lean towards no. You know, well, I think what we've seen here is it could be a double-edged sword in a lot of ways, and there are strengths to wherever you are on that, you know, imagery spectrum. Yeah. Definitely. And there is, I should throw in here, I mean, there are people, there are, uh, there are some data, but not a lot. And there are many uh, reports of, of people taking psychedelics um, and then temporarily having the experience of imagery. A lot of that imagery, again, is described as more involuntary. So things will start just changing or appearing, changes in perception. And you can kind of classify that as, as a type of imagery. And some people will have also reported that they gain the ability to voluntarily visualize. Again, I'm not suggesting you should go out there and try that, but there's some interesting um, reports coming from individuals who have tried that and 
had the temporarily temporal temporary experience of having um, mental imagery. Great. Okay. Um, how does aphantasia affect the other senses? And we touched on this briefly, but maybe we'll go into some more detail here. Yeah. So we, like I said, before, right, right at the beginning, that maybe the first question that we see um, that a subset of people from the minority of people we've tested so far, but that could be a result of how we're recruiting and how people come to us have uh, multi-sensory um, aphantasia. So they cannot create a sensory simulation in any of their senses. Um, so we have that, right? So you could say, how does aphantasia affect the other senses? What we don't know, I guess, if, I, if someone's a pure visually aphantasic, whether their other senses sort of become stronger to compensate for that. So we, I think that there's some data in people who lose their vision, become blind, and they see a sharpening in their other senses. So would that also sort of work and correspond to the mind's eye? If I lose my visual imagery to my other, because my imagery in my other senses become stronger? Interesting question. We haven't, I don't, haven't seen any data on that, but that would be a, a fun kind of experiment to, to try and do. Yeah. All right, here's a question from Peter. Aphantasia and the experience of sexuality. Aphantasia. I haven't, again, we haven't run any experiments that would speak to that. Um, I haven't seen any data to speak to that. I guess, like I said before, I have heard people who have aphantasia talk about um, sexual fantasies and not having imagery, that they're missing out on this whole fantasy world. Um, right, so as I said before, any anything that um, is going to benefit or, or change from a sensory simulation, imagining you know particular scenarios, um, is going to be different with or without imagery. So I imagine that kind of sexual fantasy world would be very different without imagery. Um, but again, interesting question. I haven't seen any data on that. I'm not sure or aware of anyone doing that kind of research. But yeah, interesting question that probably has uh, some implications for, for lots of people. All right, here's another one from Andrew. Is aphantasia known to be genetic? Are my children also likely to have a similar lack of mental imagery? As I said, yeah, there, there's some evidence uh, that there might be some degree of hereditariness, if you like, in aphantasia. Um, I don't think we've mapped out those genes yet, but I think there's some data starting to come in now from different labs suggesting that there is some element. We're seeing a few more cases within families uh, than you would expect by chance. Um, again, that does not mean that if you are a fantastic that your kids will necessarily be. It just means there might be a higher probability of that running in families, um, but it won't be, you know, won't be anywhere near 100%. So yeah, as I said, there's some clues that are suggesting there might be a genetic component. Um, the exact mechanism of that, if it's a direct genetic component or not, we don't know yet. But um, stay tuned. As soon as I, I hear something, I'll let you know. Thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, okay, let's see what's next here. I'll pick one here. Uh, okay, what research is currently being planned? Oh, great question. Give out all our secrets. Um, no, that's fine here. So, so yeah, we have a long list of of planned uh, to do experiments, and and we've got a whole bunch of those are underway already, and there's a long list of ones we want to do. So I think the PTSD question is really interesting. We've got a couple of different experiments at the moment looking at models of PTSD and how that may be different or not without imagery. Uh, mind wandering and thought control, we're doing some experiments there. How much control do I have over my thoughts with or without imagery, right? And so the paper that's coming out next week um, shows that imagery links our thoughts to emotions, right? And so you take away imagery, that thought experience is going to be quite different. The emotion is going to be a little bit lower. And so things are going to be different around thoughts. Um, yeah, I'd like to start looking at creativity as well. I think that's interesting. Um, what else have we got planned? We've got some experiments looking at false memories. So 
um, there's some data suggesting that if you have very strong imagery, um, let's say you witness, you know, I don't know, um, a bank robbery, um, and you know you come home and you're like thinking over and over, and you tell your friends, oh, I saw this, this happened, and then someone says, oh, did the person get injured? And you say, oh, let me try and think about that. Every time you access that memory with strong imagery, you're sort of reliving parts of it. And if someone says, you know, was there a red car outside the bank? You sort of imagine a red car and then put that in the memory. And then what it looks like is happening is that memory kind of blends into the original memory. And then the next day when you try and think about it, what happened, the red car pops up. So if you have strong imagery, your memory actually gets corrupted more. It's kind of, you have these false memories that can be injected into your memory. Uh, and so the logic again will hold that if you don't have imagery, you should have more stable memories over time, and they should be less liable to disruption for those kinds of eyewitness memories, which I think is an interesting thing. So we've got some experiments planned around that. Uh, and then the big one um, that we have planned but we haven't started yet, which is sort of a large-scale training and brain stimulation um, experiment trying to take people with you know, zero imagery or purely aphantasic and see if we can give them some imagery. Again, there's some interesting ethical things around that, like I said, that we can only use people who want to have imagery with the understanding that once they get it, they probably can't switch it off. We don't know, but they probably won't be able to switch it off and they may or may not enjoy that imagery. So there's an interesting uh, ethical layer to that that we have to consider you know, doing the kind of research we do. Um, yeah, and, and, and there, are, there are hundreds more experiments we want to do. So I guess mapping out the terrain of things that we might, if you have imagery, you tend to use imagery for. Anything that might benefit from a sensory simulation and how is behavior and thoughts going to be cognition be different without imagery and those scenarios. And there's a long list of those things. And so we've got a whole list of experiments, but um, at the moment, yeah, it's, it's really sort of the constraint is on, on funding. Um, it is such a new area and, you know, scientists are notoriously conservative. Um, and so it is hard to get large government grants or any large grants on aphantasia at the moment. Uh, I think that will start changing over time and we can start ramping up the research with bigger teams um, as things uh, are more objectively documented and as these papers I've mentioned start coming out over the next few months and my colleagues are much more convinced that it's a real thing with these objective um, physiological measurements. Yeah. Lots of research to be done for sure. Uh, oh, yeah. Great to see so much interest growing. Um, how can people get involved with your research and aphantasia research globally? Yeah, so you can come to uh, either uh, my website, so profjoelpearson.com, and, and sign up to be part of Aphantasia Research there, or my lab, futuremindslab.com. We have portals there where you can sign up to be on our databases. Um, and so we um, recruit to be part of online experiments. If we're running experiments here in Sydney, then, and if you're in Sydney, then you come onto campus and you can maybe do some uh, fMRI, some brain scan experiments and, and, and brain stimulation experiments or EEG experiments. Um, but we're also running a lot of online experiments uh, these days in COVID times. And so, yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, wherever you are in the world, sign up and you can be part of our research and help out there. Um, you can also be part of the Aphantasia network um, yeah, and sign up to be on their database uh, and that sort of can plug you into not only our lab, but other labs as well. Yeah, and just follow sort of me and the other people on Twitter um, or Instagram or whatever, you know, your platform of choice. I think for science, Twitter seems to be the most active platform that I've seen. So I follow people discussing um, mental imagery uh, and aphantasia and hyperphantasia, which we haven't talked about much, uh, things. Yeah, hopefully we'll get to that before the end. And uh, and yeah, I'll add that we do, we do have a newsletter at aphantasia.com. Uh, and so we you know regularly send out different research opportunities uh, with labs from all over the world. So if you're not, uh, everyone can go sign up there. Okay, the next question is, given the correlation between aphantasia and the STEM field, how do artists, dancers, et cetera, find success in creative fields? How is this possible? It's a great question. I was at, I was in an art and opening for an exhibition, a book launch at the, at a, the Powerhouse Museum here in Sydney last night, and we were discussing this exact issue. Um, 
so here's the thing. So, so even though we see these trends in terms of um, careers, um, the sort of more people with aphantasia going towards STEM, it doesn't mean that you can't be creative, you can't be an artist uh, if you're aphantasic. So we know that there are many fantastic artists who are aphantasic. We know that one of the top animators at Pixar was aphantasic. And Ed Catmull, the, the founder, co-founder, and um, person who ran Pixar and, and Disney Studios, also aphantasic. Um, and in 2019, there was a, Extreme Imagination exhibition of artists who are aphantasic, which toured around the UK. And so we see lots of artists who are aphantasic. So being aphantasic is not a roadblock to being an artist, to being an entrepreneur, to being creative, to being whatever you might be thinking. Um, so that being said, and when I've sat down with, with artists and asked them to occasionally okay, you know, draw an apple and the individual sit, just sits down and draws a beautiful apple, and I said, well, could, did you visualize the apple before you drew it? And they said, no, I, could, I have no capacity to do that. I just see nothing black on black. But once they start drawing, they know what an apple looks like and they know where to move their hand. And so that sort of real-time interaction with the, with the pencil uh, enabled them to draw a really beautiful and accurate apple, even though they didn't or couldn't visualize it right before, moments before. Um, and so you don't need to have a mental image in your mind's eye to be able to draw things realistically. Um, you don't need a mental image to be creative. Um, yeah, so it is absolutely possible. Um, you can be an artist, a dancer, a musician, whatever you might want to be with or without imagery. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, we we even at the Affentation Network hear from so many artists, musicians, uh, people doing lots of different creative work, uh, and so so yeah, I, I, it's definitely um, not going to prevent you from from doing that kind of work. Uh, so I guess that yeah, is Affentation a disability? No, I, I don't think we should call it that. Again, we are, as a field, we're not. I'm not sure yet of the best phrase to use, but for aphantasia, part of human diversity, neural diversity. Um, like I said, the, the, the biggest difference we've seen so far in any of the data sets is that emotional response to scary thoughts. Um, so we see there's clear differences there. So anything that may be involving emotion and your thoughts, there's going to be a difference there. And that being said, it may be a positive thing, it may be a silver lining, it may be not a negative thing at all, that you may be more immune to types of anxiety, right? So I don't want anyone to think about it as a disability or blame having aphantasia on things that have happened uh, in your life. Um, it's not a disability. It's a difference in your brain and different in the way you think, um, just thinking without pictures, if you like. Um, and most of the experiments we've seen that there aren't huge differences, right? And that's why you will have people, and many people want to give a public talk, will discover that they are aphantasic, or more, more often it's the other way around, they discover that other people can visualize, and they're utterly shocked and floored by this discovery, and it happens over and over. And so the simple fact that they've spent their life thinking that the mind's eye and mental imagery was a metaphor, it wasn't a real thing that you could experience, um, but then their life's, you know, haven't even noticed the differences in their life. So it's not a disability. Um, we shouldn't think of it as that. Thank you. Totally agree with that. Um, okay, here's the, the question that's popped up on the screen uh, more than once now. Is there any correlation between mm -hmm. IQ and aphantasia? Good question. Uh, do we have any good data sets on that? We haven't done that. I'm trying to think if Adam Zeman has any data on that. I can't, I don't think I've seen any data sets linking those two. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer. I haven't seen it yet, but but an interesting uh, interesting experiment to run. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to be careful how you define IQ because some of the subcomponents of those tests might involve um, types of visualization or memory, and so you might expect that some subcomponents could be different, uh, and you need to be careful how you interpret that. Okay, here's, uh, here's another one. Does the degree of Fantasia in the general population follow a normal distribution 
with aphantasia and hyperphantasia at the tails, or is there some other kind of distribution? Oh, oh good question. Really good question. Yeah. I mean, what, in the data sets we've seen, I think it's pretty normal. Certainly when, in the many hundreds of people we've tested with the objective me methods we have here, it tends to be fairly normal. Um, the peak somewhere in the middle there, um, sort of normal distribution and, and flattening out with these sort of longer tails to the hyper and to the AFANS. And I think, I mean, Tom, you've, you've got Aphantasia Network has a large, a huge data set now of, of VVIQ data. I'm trying to remember, I think that's fairly normal, just a normal distribution as well, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, we have a big selection bias, of course, being hosted on, you know, aphantasia.com. So it's hard to say, is it representative of the general yeah, public? Sure. But we definitely see a, see a wide distribution, but actually on our data set, we see spikes on both ends. So we see the, yeah. you know, the biggest numbers on, on you know, either end and kind of flat throughout. But again, I don't think it's representative of the general public because, you know, you have to be searching aphantasia to, to find it. Um, yeah. You know, so that's going to bias your, your selection that way. So, yeah, really interesting to see kind of as, as the research scales uh, to more general public to, to see how that. Yeah, goes. I mean, what, what I'm, I'm interested as well is what I see the diff an important question is, is having no imagery being truly aphantasic, different categorically somehow to having a little bit of imagery kind of thing. Is it a smooth function or is, it, is there really a step there? And that something is just totally different to nothing. Um, mm -hmm. You have similar questions we kind of know less about hyper um, hyperphantasia right so so we haven't got a good definition for that yet um, simply having scores of a questionnaire or having scores of our objective binocular rivalry measurement I don't think is enough when you start talking to people who have this photorealistic uh, imagery ability and they can talk about um, watching a film and then imagine that film and those two experiences being the same um, it doesn't feel like the kind of task we have here in the lab really capture that. Um, and other sort of, you, you might think of side effects of that that, that that I've discussed with people with very strong imagery is that they will imagine having a conversation with someone and then the next day they won't, they won't they'll be unsure whether they had the conversation or just imagine that they get quite confused um, around that. So I think there's some scope there to have some more general or wider definition of what a hyper fantasia might encompass yeah. yeah that's really interesting um what does an average or more common degree of fantasia look like of oh, fantasia it's hard to just use a whole lot of words for me and describe it here i could describe it in terms of our objective numbers in terms of our objective priming scores now but off the rivalry or the pupil thing but that's not really useful for me to describe to you that I think mm, I'll go on a limb. So let's say that the peak of those functions, the normal distribution, would be able to visualize something, right? They're not seeing this beautiful apple sitting out here floating in front of them. Um, they kind of catch a glimpse of the apple and then it disappears um, and then it comes back when they try and then it fades again. We talk a lot about uh, also like projectors, whether the apple is just somewhere or it's out there in front in front of me in space and where I can imagine that apple as another dimension that uh, hasn't been captured a lot or discussed a lot. Um, so there's differences there as well. Some people can imagine the apple and place it in front of someone's face while they're talking to them. I can't do that, for example. Um, so there's degrees in just the strength and vividness and the colours of, say, the apple where the apple can be, how you can manipulate the apple. Um, then there's sort of degrees. We've tried to design some experiments to look at this. We haven't published yet around, like I said, the apple appears and then it disappears. And then you put effort in and it comes back again. Um, so how long you can keep your mental image present would be another factor that would be interesting to look at. Some people maybe can just create it and hold it there easily. Other people have to put a lot of effort in to keep sort of regenerating it. Um, so yeah, it's a hard question to answer what is the average Fantasia or imagery experience like, but it will incorporate a lot of the things and characteristics I just mentioned. Great. Okay. Um, here's one from Melissa. How do I support a child with Aphantasia? Are there methods of support or teaching that you recommend? 
Hmm. Yeah, really good question. I mean, we haven't done the research yet, so I don't want to say definitively you should do this, you shouldn't do this. I would encourage, that being said, um, you know, I'm not a, a, a neurologist, I'm not a, a doctor, I'm not prescribing, or I'm not a school teacher, but encourage the child, children to, they really can't imagine, talk to them about that and say, you know, it's that's okay, there are other ways of doing things and talk about using different strategies and, and play around with what those strategies might be. Um, look at imagery and the other senses like we've discussed quite a few times today. Um, think about spatial location. So a lot of people who have aphantasia still have very good spatial locations. They know what's behind them. They know what's in front of them. They can sort of localize things in space really well and manipulate things, um, which is a whole sort of interesting um, side note in itself. So talk about, yeah, different ways of achieving. If they have to remember a phone number, how they're going to do it. If they have to remember how many uh, toys are on the ground, how are they going to do that? Can they use numbers? Can they use geometry? Can they use other spatial things? So playing around, experimenting with different uh, strategies and techniques. Great. Thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, how can we objectively measure aphantasia in all of the senses? Hmm. I would love to know the answer to that question. Um, we're not there yet. We, we've just sort of, we're, we're there now with vision. Um, we're not there with the other senses. We can probably try and do something like that with some of the, the physiological measurements we've done with vision uh, or using brain scanning. So the, the way in cognitive neuroscience, typically people do things first in the visual domain, whether it's cognition or perception or mental imagery, first in vision, for a number of reasons. They're kind of easier experiments to run. Almost the whole back of our brain is dedicated to visual processes. So there's more neural tissue, if you like, to look at these mechanisms and a few other reasons. So things tend to happen first with vision and then they spread out to the other senses. So that's probably going to start happening um, fairly soon. I think we can develop um, physiological or neural ways to measure it, imagery or lack of it in other senses. Um, what would be nice would be a fast, objective behavioural method that you could do at home or in the doctor's office or wherever it might be, um, online through a portal, through virtual reality, something like that. Um, but we haven't, we're not there yet. We're working on it um, and we'll, get, we'll let you know when we have something. Absolutely. Okay, we've got um, time for maybe just one or two questions left. Oh, yeah. Yeah, How's just flying by. Wow. Okay. Lindsay says, what are your thoughts about aphantasia combined with synesthesia? Yeah, so yeah, interesting question and, and kind of a controversial question. So so, so we know what aphantasia is. Synesthesia is a, is, a, is a condition or, again, something similar in terms of neural diversity. And the most common way that shows up is people have colours associated with letters or numbers. Um, there are other cooler types of synesthesia where you have flavors associated with sounds, someone will play some music and you'll have a taste or um, maybe it's taste and color, but your senses are kind of cross-wired uh, is the best way to think about synesthesia. And all the research, well, all the research up until recently had shown that people with synesthesia had stronger imagery. And we'd, we'd, we've done some research with that. So we sort of developed a way to utilize the binocular ivory method I mentioned before as a, an objective, reliable way to measure synesthesia in a, in a similar way. And in that study, we showed that, again, people have stronger imagery who are synesthetic. Um, just recently, a paper was published a few weeks ago, a month ago, um, showing that you can have, if you take a whole lot of people that have synesthesia and you look at their imagery strength, you can find just a few people um, that are aphantasic. Again, if we're looking at such low probabilities of things in the population and then you have a subcategory of population, say it's 5%, 5%, it gets very hard to be confident with the numbers. And I can't remember the exact numbers of this paper, but it was really low. When you get to the sort of the, 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 the lower score, let's say, on an imagery questionnaire, there are only a few people that seem like they um, had what you call aphantasia and synesthesia out of several, um, several thousand 
Um, and again, it's hard to know whether that was statistically significant in the way they did those uh, in that study. Um, so that study was kind of surprising because it went against what we thought the mechanisms were. We thought that imagery and synesthesia were linked somehow. Uh, and therefore, if you're aphantasic, you shouldn't be able to have synesthesia. This paper suggests it might be possible. I think we need to get some bigger data sets or do some more objective measurements uh, of, of imagery uh, rather than just the questionnaires to try and sort of clarify what exactly is going on here. Great. Well, uh, thank you everybody for the questions. Um, looks like the time is up and we've come to an end. Uh, thank you again for sending all your questions. And while we couldn't get to them all, this just means we're going to have to do something like this uh, over again. Uh, this conversation will continue over the weekend at our second virtual Aphantasia meetup. Uh, there are only a few spots left. So if you're interested, you can grab tickets by visiting the link on your screen. Uh, I'll also be posting those in the chats and comments below. Uh, we're doing a lot of the Affentation Network. Uh, Imagination Spectrum is a new multi-sensory imagery survey that we've been developing. Uh, we're working on our podcast called Imagine That, uh, and we're already working with some brilliant minds, writing articles and uh, gathering people's experience and posting those on the website. Um, I'd appreciate it if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel so uh, you know we can, we can grow that and continue to do this kind of work. Um, be sure to check it all out. And if you'd like to get involved, head over to our website, aphantasia.com slash get involved. And there's lots of different ways that, you know, you can get involved in research or, you know, kind of help out what we're doing and, and kind of spread the word. Uh, momentum is definitely growing on that front. Uh, but for now, until next time, uh, thank you, Joel Pearson. Uh, I'm Tommy Byer, and good night. Yeah, good night, everyone. Hope it was helpful. <laughs>